Well, I'm um, I'm no stranger to uh, Hope Bible Church, my wife and I, because uh, I, I must admit that Hope Bible Church will always be part of my family's life and heart, because back in 1995, when Tom and I were sitting in um, a class, uh, I believe it, I don't remember what class it was actually, but um, we, we, we just met, we were sitting right next to each other, of course we were on the back row, you know, and um, we started talking and 10 minutes into the conversation, it was already ministry. It was already church planting. It was already what he's going to do. And uh, ever since then, it uh, we we just struck a, conver- a, a relationship that was it got closer. And I I've developed a, a really a uh, love for Tom Pastor Tom Leak. And um, and then we talked about the church uh, and and what he was going to do. And and then I met, of course, his wife. Sue and then Hannah and Grace and Faith. Josiah wasn't around yet, but um, I got to meet him later on. And uh, and then, of course, I got, I got to meet the elders here and the deacons that have worked in this ministry for many, many years. And so it, it's I follow this ministry uh, right from the beginning, right from its meager beginning. And uh, Pastor Leek really depended on the Lord to build this church, and he did build it. Um, and now that the Lord called his servant home, I just pray that the Lord would give you all wisdom to choose the next man to carry on this good work. And that you may really all keep unity in the bond of peace given by the Holy Spirit, and that all of you may be willing joyful servants ready to continue to build this church body healthy so that you will remain salt in light in this ever darkening world to be able to point people to the only remedy for their sin jesus christ amen that's what we're all about as the church and um so i must admit that this church will always be in my heart and close to me. Not because of the pastor, but because everybody I've met after that. And, but, um, and Tom was a very, he, they say I was a mentor to him. I think he was a mentor to me (laughs) because every time I talk with him, I learn something from him. And then, and I think it was vice versa, but I really love, uh, the Lake family and, and this church. And so, um, this morning I really want to, preach to you on the only way in to the kingdom of God and the true church is through this door. Let's pray. Lord, this morning, thank you for this opportunity. I pray you would continue to bless this church and its leaders and those who are serving with wisdom as they have this meeting on October 31st, Lord, I pray that you would you would grant clarity to explain the process of hiring another man to take the leadership role here at this church. And Lord, bring the right person here, the one who will just continue on what Pastor Leek started. And I pray, Lord, that it would continue in the philosophy of ministry, the doctrinal stance of this ministry. And just, Lord, that person would understand where it needs to go next and that you would continue to keep your hand upon it so there would be no schism or division within this body. So, Lord, bring those things to pass so your name is lifted up and Jesus Christ is glorified in all things. And I pray that you would bless your word this morning as I preach it to these people in Christ's name. Amen. Now, since the Apollo space program began, our country started sending manual capsules into space. And one of the most difficult parts of each mission was re-entry, the re-entry process. The reason 
for the difficulty was the space, spacecraft with its crew had only one door of opportunity to enter into the Earth's atmosphere. The pilot had to make sure that his approach, as he was approaching the, the door at just the right speed, at just the right angle, if he did not, then they would burn up or bounce off the earth and wander into space with no way to return, lost forever. Likewise, all those who enter the kingdom of God, they have one door to enter through. If I were to ask you this Lord's Day morning, are you part of Christ's body? Are you a member of Christ's church? How would you answer those questions? Maybe with an emphatic yes, maybe a little bit reluctant to answer. Maybe you will answer no. Or maybe you're just not sure how to answer that question. But if you answered yes, what assured you that you have, in fact, gained entry as a member of Christ's true church? And what I'm asking is that did you enter through the one and only entry point? If you didn't, you're not part of God's church, which he purchased with his own blood. Jesus gave a parable about the good shepherd. And the good shepherd stands in the only entryway to the sheepfold. If you want to enter this sheepfold, you must come through the shepherd. So I'd like you to direct your attention this morning at verses 7 through 11 of the Gospel of John, chapter 10, specifically verse number 9. Because there is only one entry point into Christ's true church. And what entry point is Scripture referring to? Well, here in our passage in verse number 7, it says, So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. Verse number nine, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So the leaders of Israel who are referred to here as those who kill and destroy are the ones who were not the true shepherds. They were thieves and robbers. They were pointing people to get right with God just merely by the law or by human tradition, and at the same time rejecting the prophets and killing the prophets who came to tell them the truth. So they pointed people in the wrong direction to enter into God's sheepfold. They pointed them to the wrong door. Now, in saying that, I would like to give you some of the presumed entry points into Christ's church that are, have been around for a long time but even some new ones that have come up and then come back to our passage. I would like to consider the presumed entry points some still try to use in order to enter into Christ's true church. The first presumed entry point some rest upon for entryway into Christ's church is, of course, they were baptized. They have been either sprinkled some poured, some dipped, others immersed. Some were infants, some children, others were adults. But the truth of the matter is, according to Scripture, it doesn't matter if you were sprinkled, poured, or dipped. 
or immersed if they never came to Christ by true faith, they are nothing but baptized heathen, and they are still in their sin. You are not saved in baptism like the Roman Catholic Church espouses. The door is not baptism, but Christ. You see, the only if one comes to Christ in repentance and trusting in Jesus alone, who is God's great way of salvation, can a person have entryway into God's true church. Jesus said right here in John, John chapter 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now, that's the first one. Second presumed entry point into Christ's church is that of, some have called it a birthright. I was born into a Christian family. So I believe I've always been a Christian. I hear that. You hear that when you talk to people about the Lord. And a birthright is really a basic right that someone has or is thought to be entitled to from birth, whether it's property or money or even spiritual privilege. Some feel entitled to it because they belong to a certain family. I grew up a Baptist. I grew up a Catholic. I grew up Reformed. I grew up Methodist. And they kind of bank on that. Or I grew up in a particular family. So it's a great privilege to have Christian parents. But to grow up in a Christian home and attend a Christian church does not mean you have admission into Christ's true church. It is, of course, a great advantage because you have access to the truth of God's word. And because of that privilege, there comes great responsibility. And that responsibility must be used rightly. If not, it could be a great blessing or it could be a great curse. So you see, born into a family of a long or a short line of saints does not guarantee anyone's salvation. The Bible still says in John 3, 3, and Jesus, of course, said unto Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He said that to a leading teacher in the nation of Israel who thought he was in the sheepfold of God. And Jesus is telling him, no, you're not. You've got to be born again. I'm sure that was a shock for him on that day. So. The goal to all Christians should be to glorify God. Under this overarching goal, the aim of parenting is to be a faithful instrument in God's hands for actively bringing up children in accord with biblical principles. Every child is born a sinner who intrinsically follows out his or her depravity. So then the task of a parent is not easy. But God has not left us without instruction. God has commanded, his commands are clear about that. And of course, he says even in Ephesians 4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. It's my observation that parents really should first focus their children on the Ten Commandments and also the book of Proverbs, that these teachings will expose the child's own sinful nature along with God's character and what the Creator requires with the goal of preparing the soil of a child's heart, making it ready for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if the goal of parenting then is to be faithful to bring up one's children in accord with biblical principles, both taught and modeled, are there any guarantees? Regarding the outcome, the answer to that would have to be no, because the child's response is not necessarily the the measure of biblical parenting. A godly example and good training cannot equal or ensure conversion. Just as by God's grace, 
An ungodly parent may even have the blessing of godly children. Hence, a godly person is not guaranteed by their efforts that the Lord will save any of their children. However, when the grace of God has entered the home, the possibilities of salvation coming to that, the children is heightened because God's word is there. The example is there. The church is there. So the parent's duty before the Lord is to be faithful to their instruction and their modeling and raise their children in a manner that the Lord has commanded. But the results are the Lord's to determine. That's God's sovereignty. The bottom line then is this. You must be born again yourselves. You have no right of entry into Christ's church except as by your own personal and individual faith in Jesus Christ. It is not your mother and father that can be the door to Christ's church. No, it must be Christ who is the door, and everyone individually must come through him. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one, no one can come to the Father except through him. That's a reality that we all have to face as parents. That maybe not all our children will be saved, but we still pray for them. We still model an example of Christ before them, no matter where they're at, and pray till the day uh, that someday they may be saved. A third presumed entry point some may rest upon to enter for entryway into Christ's church is a profession of faith. Common these days that just because someone made a profession of faith, signed a card, raised a hand, went forward in an evangelistic meeting, that they are part of God's true church. Mere profession, though, cannot prove a genuine Christian. The willingness for you to say, I profess this or I confess that, no more will make a Christian than someone who stands in a garage and proclaims themselves a car. There must be true repentance and true believing, which must then bear the fruit of progressive holiness and godliness. The person who makes a profession of faith of having it when they don't have it is a person who is in great danger. It was Jerry Bridges uh, who said, the only safe evidence that we are in Christ is a holy life. If you know nothing of holiness, he went on to say, you shouldn't flatter yourself that you are a Christian. He said the bottom line is that it is not those who profess to know Christ who will enter heaven, but those who live holy lives. See, their holy progress is manifested more and more in their thinking, in their words, in their actions, in their outlook, in their worldview, and in their passions and desires, especially that of to obey and follow Jesus willingly. It was the epistle of Titus that it, it, it records there. They can profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him being detestable and disobedient, worthless for any good thing. So this passage that I just mentioned says that these kinds of people claim to know God, but they deny him by the very way they live. That is a very dangerous way to live and calling yourself a Christian. The Lord did not command to get a profession of faith. The Lord commanded to make disciples. And disciples are people who are learners. They're followers of Christ. So it's not merely your profession of faith, but your repentance of sin leading to a cleansed and a transformed life because you came through the door, Jesus Christ, into his church. And you received his Holy Spirit. And now the Spirit of God is in you, sanctifying you, making you like Christ. A fourth presumed entry point that some may rest upon to enter 
Christ's church is church membership. There are those who think because they are members of a, of a visible church that they're in. If they have trusted an external organization to help them feel secure, they're just deceiving themselves. Because if they have bypassed the door of living faith in Christ and have tried to get in without being a disciple of Christ, well, then Christ will say to them that they are a thief and they are a robber because they try to get in some other way without coming through the door, through the shepherd of the sheepfold. However, if you are truly born again, well, then baptism, a profession of faith in Christ, Membership in a Bible-believing, Christ-honoring assembly shows that you desire to obey the Lord and reverence Him. So commitment to Christ should go hand-in-hand hand with commitment to His church. Now, there are other supposed points that have crept in that is worth mentioning. And that is that of moralism. Some people say, wait a minute, I'm a pretty good person. And to the best of my ability, I live a moral life. Surely that must count for something. Many bank on the entry point into God's true church is simply by being a moral person. This is very popular today. The basic structure of moralism really comes down to this, a belief that the gospel can be reduced to improvements of behavior. Far too many believers and their churches succumb to the logic of moralism and reduce the gospel to a message of moral improvement. In other words, we communicate to the lost person the message that what God desires for them and demands of them is to get their lives straight. That's actually a false gospel. It was Paul who told the Galatians, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Some most moralists would not claim to be without sin, but merely as Al Mohler said, without scandal, without scandalous sin. So the essence of moralism is the belief that we can achieve righteousness by means of proper behavior. And theologically, the wrong assumption that what God expects, expects of fallen humanity is moral improvement. Now, it is good for parents to rightly teach their children to obey moral instruction. The church also bears the responsibility to teach the moral commands of God and to bear witness to the larger society of what God has declared to be right and good for human creatures. But these impulses, right and necessary as they are, are not the gospel. Indeed, one of the most insidious false gospels is moralism that people that really promise the favor of God and the satisfaction of God's righteousness to sinners if they will only behave and commit themselves to moral improvement. Now, don't misunderstand. Being moral is good, but it doesn't save. It cannot earn one's salvation. And to the moralist, the Bible simply becomes a code book for human behavior. Moral instruction replaces the teaching of the gospel of Christ. So the corrective for moralism comes directly again from Scripture in Galatians chapter 2, where Paul says, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ, even we have believed in Christ, so that we may be justified 
by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. So moralism makes sense to sinners. For it is but an expansion of what they have already been taught in their early days. But moralism is not the gospel. It will not save. The only gospel that saves is the gospel of Christ. And again, the Apostle Paul tells us in Galatians 4, But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he may redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. That's how you get in to the family of God. That's how you get into the sheepfold of God. That's how you get into the true church of God, that we are justified by faith alone, saved by grace alone, redeemed from our sin by Christ alone. Moralism produces sinners who are potentially better behaved. The gospel of Christ transforms sinners into the adopted sons and daughters of God. So the church must never evade or accommodate or revise or hide the law of God. Indeed, it is the law that shows us our sin and makes clear our inadequacy and our total lack of righteousness. The law cannot impart life, though. As Paul again says in Galatians, therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. Again, to lead us to what? To the door, to the shepherd, to the only one who could save us, so that we may be justified, not by works, but by faith. A sad thought is, is that hell will be highly populated by people who were raised right, who were moral. The citizens of heaven will be those who, by the sheer and mercy and grace of God, are there solely because of the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. So moralism is not the gospel. It is also an improper entry point to the kingdom of God and to the church of Jesus Christ. A sinner must come through the only door, through Jesus, the good shepherd. And why is that? Because Jesus Christ is the only one who laid down his life for his sheep. Jesus the, is the only one who died in the place of his sheep. There's another one I want to mention of entryway, and that is a pluralistic ideology. And what that is, is that a plural pluralism really comes down to this. A pluralist believes that Jesus is the provision that God had made for Christians. But there are other ways to get right with God and gain eternal bliss into other religions, from in other religions. The work of Christ is useful for the Christian, but not necessary for the non-Christian. So this is just a bunch of hogwash, that Christians should not reason, as some do, thinking that truth is like a great mountain. The gospel is like a great mountain with one summit and many ra- ways to reach that summit. And then it doesn't matter which way you reach the top as long as you make it to the top. What is the authority of that kind of thinking? For the pluralist, the final authority is their own mind. They have no blueprints or a measuring device to show themselves that they are actually in error. There's only one way to measure whether one is correct in one's beliefs concerning the soundness of a mental foundation, and that is the truth. That is the truth of the Word of God. 
when Paul teaches the Ephesians in his letter to them, he said, listen, you want to be confident in your thinking? Then this is the foundation. He said, having been built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Christ himself being the cornerstone, that Paul's he very clearly draws the line in the sand between what is true and what is false. Anything that is not from the foundation of the apostles and prophets or correctly aligned with Christ, the chief cornerstone, is not to be relied upon as spiritual truth. See, there's not many entry points into Christ's true church. There is but one. The pluralist concludes wrongly that there are many good and different ways to enter into favor with God. They have a faulty understanding. It is an improper entry point. And so they are knocking at the wrong door. There's another one, and there's a whole list of them, actually. But I have no time for that. But I want to mention the last one, but say just a very little about it. And that is... The religion of wokeness. Owen Strachan just writes, wrote a book on Christianity and wokeness. I'm reading it right now. I'm in the middle of it. But he said this. He says, wokeness is a religious system that traps a person in their works, taking them captive as one trusts works to attain social salvation, but they never attain it. They never can attain it. Why? Because that's not the way into the kingdom of God. That's not the way into the true church of God. There is only one way. All these things I've just mentioned just reveal that people want to be part of something. They want to be part of Christ's church, or they want to feel they're right with God, or they just say and want to say, listen, I'm a spiritual person, and I think I'm okay. But because of the way they chose to enter, not by the door, but by another way, they cannot gain entry. The Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse number 1, it says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of sheep, but climbs up some other way, is a thief and is a robber. My friend, candidates for Christ's true church must make a credible profession of faith. And that they have entered by the door of Jesus Christ and in Christ alone. It does not matter if a person has a baptism certificate or a membership certificate or if they adhere to some popular theology of how to have, have a spiritual life and be right with God that they would think hopeful for themselves and society. If a person does not have Christ, the only thing that that thinking is good for and the paper is good for it, is a waste paper basket. The only way to get into the real living church is by coming to Christ himself, who is the door, by simple faith and dependence upon Jesus. Yes, the one who bled and died on Calvary's cross and defeated Satan and death and rose from the grave. Any other way is a sham and the preaching of any other system is a delusion. There must, it must be Christ who is the door and everyone individually must come through him in order to be saved. Saved by the righteousness of another. And as Luther said, saved by an alien righteousness. If you're to enter the kingdom of of God. The door is Jesus. Come to him. He will save you. And brethren, have you come to the door? Have you come to Jesus Christ? If you have trusted in Jesus Christ and have entered into the door through the shepherd, well, then you have come. 
You have come in by God's appointed way. But if you have not come to call on Jesus and trust Him as Lord and Savior, don't put it off. However, I must warn you, if you have not yet come, you remain in a state of unbelief. And the Word of God tells us, He who believes in Him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So I can stand here this morning and preach to you about entering into the kingdom of God through the door of Jesus Christ. And you may say, you know what, I believe that. I think that is true. But if you merely walk up to the door, it is in vain to look at a door unless you enter it. That's the whole point of a door, to open it up and enter it. And I pray this morning that God would give you the grace to come in if you have never entered before. But please do not think you are safe from God's wrath if you have not entered by his appointed way. And I'd like you to direct your attention now to verse number 9 of John chapter 10. Because it says there, I am the door. John 10, verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters through me. Now, that brings me to this point, that the persons who enter through God's appointed means can claim certain privileges and distinctives. And this was encouraging for a believer. I can now with great confidence that as a person enters in the right way, that there are certain privileges and distinctives that are theirs and will always be theirs. You'll find three encouraging uh, privileges, and here's the first one. Notice in verse number 9, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. That means here's the privilege. I'm saved. I'm safe from God's wrath. He who enters in by the door shall be saved, just like Noah and his family was kept safe from the destructive power of the great flood, but he was not kept safe until he passed through the door and God closed the door and sealed it on him. They were kept safe from anything that could harm them, safe from God's wrath, and God's judgment. You come to the New Testament in Ephesians, and it says that those who believe are sealed unto the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit of God. That one who comes through the door, the Spirit of God seals them. That means God owns you. That means you're his property. No one could mess with you. No one. Not Satan himself could mess with you. So, The privilege is is that we have salvation. We can claim to be saved. We can claim the safety that comes from Jesus Christ because Jesus is the ark and the door of salvation. But that is not the only, it's not only a privilege, there is the first distinctive in Christ's sheep. Look down at verse number 26 of John chapter 10 and notice what it says there. It says, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. Now, I'm reversing that. See, those who do not believe can't be Christ's sheep. So if the privilege of a sheep is that they have saving faith, and they were commanded by God to repent and believe, and they obeyed that command, then they realize that the Holy Spirit has enabled their heart to believe, to come to Christ for salvation and eternal life. And really, when a person does come to Christ by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit sweetly draws that person, opens up their eyes to see, grants them faith and repentance, and then a sinner comes to Christ with a full consent without realizing the secret influence that has been exercised over their heart by God himself, because God is the initiator of salvation, not us. He comes after us. That's what a good shepherd does. 
So saving faith really forsakes all human means of salvation. And that means first that faith comes to anyone who finally turns their back on any confidence in the flesh for salvation, and that no amount of personal effort or good works or religious deeds can ever earn a place in heaven. That saving faith involves turning from sin. I'm a helpless sinner and I need a savior. I can't save myself. And of course, saving faith involves a commitment to Christ once you are saved. A second privilege in verse number nine is this, freedom. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out. Freedom is what God gives to a believer because there is no more condemnation to those who are in Christ. Why does God, God's sheep have freedom? Because they are justified by his blood and are at peace with God. That's what everybody really wants. How do I, how do I know I'm right with God? How do I know I have peace with God? When you know that, and you have entered the door, you have freedom like you never had before. Your soul's not bound anymore. It's not under the bondage of sin. Sin's no longer master. It's not leading you around by your nose anymore. Christ is leading you. And I have freedom to go in and out. Why? Because the shepherd has opened up the way to go into the sheepfold, to go out into the world, to do the work of God with the freedom the Spirit of God gives us. There is freedom to go in to the Lord with holy boldness and prayer and to speak to the Lord as a member of God's family, to have regular and deep fellowship with the Lord. That's freedom. And we follow the shepherd. Sin no longer blocks from entering into the sheepfold. We have been set free. This is not only a privilege, but it also shows us there's a second and distinctive of Christ's sheep, and that's in verse 27. Notice what it says there, my sheep hear his voice. My sheep hear his voice. There are many voices out there. Matter of fact, all those things I mentioned are voices. They're telling you to do this way, go that way, believe that, believe this. This is how you're right with God. This is how you, how you go to heaven. There's a lot of voices. But what happens when you get the freedom of being genuinely saved, you listen to one voice. When you enter the sheepfold, you listen to the voice of the shepherd. We have a particular relationship now with the word of God. In verse 16 of John 10, it says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice. And they will become one flock with one shepherd. So to hear Christ's voice means more than being familiar with his words as they're recorded in Scripture, more than believing that they are His words. The Lord is requiring more than just simply listening respectfully and believing what He says. For the sheep, it means submitting themselves unreservedly to His authority. It means the sheep responds promptly to the orders in Scripture, the principles found in Scripture. And of course, the sheep want to obey. Why? Because he's a good shepherd. He's a shepherd that prov provides salvation. He's a shepherd that laid down his life for me. It also, as I mentioned, means you're free from the bondage of your own sin. You can now serve Christ without guilt. To get up every day and say, Lord, I'm your servant. 
take care of me today? As I go into a hostile world, I'm going in your name. Make me an instrument in your hands as I depend on you. Allow me to speak about the door and entryway into your sheepfold to the people I meet. Give me victory over my remaining sin. Give me victory over my enemy. Give me victory over the allurements and temptations of the world. Don't let me get caught in the trap of sin anymore. See, that's freedom. And the more you grow in Christ, the freer you are. And the more you grow in Christ, the more, the less this world has to offer you. The glitter and the gold gets dim. Right? I just want to go home. That's where the Spirit of God is bringing you. You just want to go home. There's really nothing here. I want to go be with my Lord. I want to see him. I, have, I, have to, I see him by faith. I have him by faith, but I want to see him. And we will someday. Pastor Leek knows all about that now. But there's a third privilege. Look at verse number nine. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Meaning this, grazing lands, nourishment. We have nourishment, that the Word of God is a source of spiritual nourishment for the soul. It is a place of instruction. It is a place to get wisdom. It's a place to be be rebuked for sin. It's a place to get spiritual strength. It's a place to get comfort. And God's sheep, once they're saved, Once they're set free, once they listen to his voice, you know what they want? They just want the word of God. They want heavenly truth. No other food will satisfy them. So they they come to the house of God through Christ, and they come for Christ. And they find rich green pastures that satisfied their soul, right? Reminds me of a very familiar passage from the Old Testament, Psalm 23, right? Where it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness. You know, it's amazing. I was looking at that verse and you know the little phrase there, lies down in green pastures? As I, was re- as I was reading, uh, there was a shepherd that was saying about that particular phrase that, you know, sheep will not lie down for three reasons. Number one, they are afraid. They can be afraid of a wolf. They can be afraid of a danger. They're afraid. The second reason why they won't lie down is because of the bully boy sheeps. You know, hens, I mean, chickens have pecking order. Well, sheep, I didn't know this, but they have bully boys. They have bully sheep who want to bully all the other sheep. And when they're getting bullied, they won't lie down because they're, again, afraid of the sheep. Of course, that's where the shepherd comes in. And the shepherd with his rod and staff has to use the rod to uh, whip the bully boy sheep into shape and get them away from the other sheep. Or maybe take them out of the flock. And there's a third reason why sheep will not lie down. They're hungry. They're not being fed. They don't have green pastures. I thought of that. I said, well, that that is, that makes that verse come alive a little bit. A lot, actually. So that means if the sheep aren't not afraid, And if the sheep are saved and safe, and the sheep are well fed, then they'll lie down. Why? Because they have no fear that they're being protected by the shepherd. And they can lie down because they ate well, and they can rest. And that's what 
he's saying there, he, then he lies, leads me beside still waters and he restores my soul and he guides me in the paths of righteousness. For his name's sake, he does that. So that's amazing to me. But it's not only the privilege, but there are two other distinctives. Look down at verse 27 and it's, it's, it says this. I know them, verse 27. I know them. I know them. That Christians have a unique relationship with him. Even as the Father knows me, John 10, 15. I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. So the union and communion with we have with the Lord that we realize God loves us and we love him. But we learn also in the New Testament that, it, it, as it says in First John, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sin. When you find out, oh, I thought I always loved God. No, you didn't. You find out you love how to love God after you become a believer, after you enter the door, after you realize how good your shepherd is, how good God is to you. You know the goodness of God will dog us the rest of our life. Can't run from it. But when we realize it, it does change our life because we realize anything that comes into our life is for our good. Doesn't that say that in Romans somewhere? And we know that all things that God causes, all things to work together for the good of those who what? Who love God, who are called according to his purpose. So Christ's sheep have a heart inclination to love him. And it shows by their obedience. But then in John 27, 10, 27, it says, they follow him too. They follow me. They're bent on following Christ, their true shepherd. And only those who hear are known of Christ and who follow him shall never perish. Now, I do like you to look at verse 28 and 29 because you know what this promises to us? It promises us double security. Only those who bear the, the distinctive marks can lay claim to eternal security. Notice in verse number 28 of chapter 10, I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them from out of my hand. And then verse 29 that was Jesus speaking, verse 29. The Father whom has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. That's double security. But you know what? We're talking about triple security. We're sealed unto the day of redemption. So the Father, the Son, the Spirit of God are involved in keeping us secure until the day we stand in his presence. It's not you and I who keep ourselves, God keeps us. So if you are Christ's sheep today, what evidence do you have to show it? Nowadays, if someone applies for a passport, they're required to give three to six points of identification. Birth certificate, driver's license, marriage license, military discharge papers, current phone bill, utility bill, something like that, to prove that you are who say you say you are. So the burden of proof is on you. See, God's saints are distinguished from all other people, not only by what he has done for them, but also by what he has worked in them. See, there's the proof. We all want proof that we're really believers. And does that mean you never doubt? You doubt sometimes. I've doubted. But I doubt it with the thought, I want to go back and examine myself. I want to go back and, and make sure I understood the gospel. I want to go back and, and make sure that I went through the right door. I didn't come some other way. I didn't deceive myself, which is the worst kind of deception. See, the saints are endowed with a new life with a spiritual and a supernatural principle or a nature which affects the whole of our being. When we 
become a Christian, God's not just working on one little area. He's working on all of you all at the same time. That's why the fruit of the Spirit is not plural. It's singular. He's working on all those things in you and I all at the same time, and he's making us like Christ. So wouldn't it be great today if you were to enter into God's true church by the door of Jesus Christ if you never have? Wouldn't that be a great thing for someone to be saved today and gain the privileges of safety and freedom and nourishment that God freely gives to those who are born into his family, and that you would be known as Christ's sheep, and that you would know you have saving faith, and that you are now ears open to listen to the voice of Christ, and then love his word, and follow Christ the rest of your life until he takes you out. See. The only per- thing a person could do is believe the gospel message, repent of their sin, transfer their trust to Jesus Christ, and by a simple transfer of trust in what they could have done to earn eternal life and trash that and trust completely in what Christ has done. That's what salvation is. But if you already come through the door of Jesus Christ, then you're saved. And not only that, rejoice. And be exceedingly glad, for so great a salvation has been bestowed upon you, of which we are learning about every time the Word of God is taught. And then, as we learn that, we also learn something else. We don't deserve any of it. It's God's mercy and grace and goodness to us, which humbles us. Humbles us to just say, who's the greatest in the kingdom of God? Those who serve. Boy, that's the principle that we need to learn, right? But God's church knows it. They know it. So this is the great mission of the church, to point people to the correct entry point into the true church, the shepherd of God's fold, Jesus Christ our Lord. For Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. And all God's people said, what? Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you this morning. That that is a message many of us have heard many times. But Lord, it just seems I never get tired of hearing the gospel. And I pray, Lord, that we would never grow tired of hearing the great things you have done to provide us eternal salvation. Oh, Lord, This morning, please do your work in people's hearts. Lord, bless this place. Let the Spirit of God reign here. Let the Word of God be exalted to its proper place as Christ is lifted up and people are drawn to Him to become real Christians who become part of your real sheepfold, part of Christ's real church. And I pray, Lord, that you would bless them exceedingly. If someone today doesn't know you, Lord, I pray that they wouldn't put it off anymore. Today would be the day of salvation. And those who know you, Lord, I pray they'd never forget the privileges that they have as a believer. They are truly blessed people in this world. And I pray as they think of that, it would just humble us. And it would just cause us to draw near to you and lift up our voices to worship you with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our strength. Use us, Lord, as servants in your church. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.